Okay, chapter 20, seventh edition NASM certified personal trainer textbook. And chapter 20 is on resistance training concepts. So it's taken all this time to get to the actual weight training part of the of the textbook. And there's a ton of material in here. Um, as always, and in particular in this chapter, I'm just gonna be honest with you, you should be taking a lot of notes, meaning um, reading and rewriting. Read it, rewrite it, just constant rewriting so that you get that physicality because there's a lot of, a lot of terms, a lot of concepts that you need to memorize from chapter 20. It's, um, it's just one of those, those chapters where, where the majority of what you're gonna be doing as a trainer is focused. And so resistance training concepts are really important. That's what chapter 20 is gonna work you through. Now, as with a number of these other chapters, uh, chapter 20, although it looks, I mean, you look at that, right? That's pretty thick, a lot, it's a big chapter. Don't be too, don't be too concerned because half of it, half of it is just on um, sample exercises, okay? I mean, one thing I do, one thing I do um, like about the way NASM has put the materials together is they're showing you, you know, the basic ways that you ought to be doing some of these exercises. We do, you know, we do train people with weights or some type of resistance. And it's a real good idea to be able to see it and to understand basic technique. And by the way, you, you simply cannot use the same exact technique on every single person, but there are basic biomechanical uh, biomechanical systems and generalities that work for everybody. You're just going to make, you know, modifications for an individual's unique biomechanics. That's all tall people and short people have different, obviously biomechanics. And even though everyone can do a squat, it's going to look a little bit different for a tall person versus a short person. But the basic biomechanical principles are, are going to be the same. So in the resistance training, chapter 20, uh, chapter here, we're going to, we're going to go through um, pretty much everything you need to know about proper resistance training uh, variables. And so read through the learning objectives. This is, again, one of those chapters where you really want to take a deep breath, step back, make sure you're taking notes for sure on this, because you got a lot to read. You got a lot of material to remember. The more you, the more you are able to take this stuff and make it real in your own in your own training. Um, the easier it is to it's going to be to remember it. It really will. And um, again, a lot of good material in here that you'll be able to use for your clients. So, of course, there's an introduction uh, to resistance training. And one of the things we always want to keep in mind, first and foremost, particularly with resistance training, is the principle of adaptation, which basically says that do something to the body environmentally and the body will adapt and change to accommodate that change in that change in environmental condition. In other words, um, if I'm used to lifting my arms out to the side all day long, right, uh, with no weight, and now I use a five pound dumbbell or a 10 pound dumbbell, my body is going to quote, adapt to that change by doing something changing in some way, shape or form. If it's a heavier weight, then my muscles get stronger. If it's doing the movement more for longer periods of time, it's going to develop endurance. So that's the concept of adaptation, uh, hypertrophy, increased cardiac, uh, cardiac capacity, VO2 max, all of these things are basic adaptations to environmental conditions. And normally the environmental condition is what you are doing to your body or to your client's body. And in this case with, with resistance training, um, so the next concept is the um, general adaptation syndrome. It's a good idea to know basically how the adaptation occurs. So GAS, G-A-S, general adaptation syndrome. It describes the way in which the body responds and adapts to stress. In other words, uh, any stress. In our case, the stresses we're talking about are, are resistance training equipment, machines, free weights, whatever the case is. Um, and so there's three components to the um, to this adaption um, adaptive uh, syndrome, and they are the alarm reaction phase stage, resistance development stage phase, um, and the exhaustion stage. So um, so when stresses are applied to the body, um, there is an initial alarm reaction 
stage, by the way, remember you do have the sidebars to read through, memorize these terms, write them down over and over until they just become a part of your, part of your um, memory. So alarm reaction stage, it's the initial reaction um, to any type of any type of stressor on the body, um, fatigue, um, joint stiffness, uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, as you can read through here. The second stage is going to be the resistance development stage. Um, a lot of things are happening at this point after the stressor has been applied. Um, the body is now adapting or changing itself to uh, be able to overcome that stressor and, and the issues and problems that it caused. So the body is basically in a, in a initial state of recovery. Um, prolonged stress or intolerable amounts of stress lead to what's known as the exhaustion, um, exhaustion stage or distress. And uh, this can result obviously in a number of different injuries and problems like stress fractures, muscle strains, uh, ligament sprains. This is what we see um, when people are training too often, they are quote overtraining, right? They do too much. They don't get enough recovery time. Um, and the body is, uh, goes into this exhaustion phase, meaning there's not enough, there's not enough recovery from the stressor, even if it's a quote, good stressor like exercise. So that's the exhaustion, the exhaustion, uh, stage. And so table 22 gives you this, gives you a, um, compilation um, compilation of those those three. If we move now on to the next page, we get to a very important principle. It's called the said principle or the principle of, of specificity, specific adaptations to imposed demands. That's S-A-I-D. So if you see that, you understand specific. It's a specific, not a general adaptive response, but specific adaptive response um, to a um, to a stressor or to stressors. Um, some types of the specificity are going to be energy systems, the mode of training, uh, muscle groups, movement patterns, posture specificity. So you can see the difference between the general adaptive syndrome versus the um, specific adaptation. Okay. And so that's what we're going to talk about as we move through the rest of this chapter at this point, mechanical, neuromuscular, metabolic specificity. It's a really good idea um, to know what the um, what mechanical specific adaptions um, are, are going to occur from. And so it's going to refer to obviously the amount of weight that you use, the, um, the movements, patterns that you're putting on the body. So that's going to be mechanical specificity. Uh, neuromuscular specificity uh, relates to the speed of contractions and the uh, type and uh, type of exercise that you're doing. Um, and then, of course, there's the metabolic specificity, which is going to be the energy systems themselves or the energy demands placed on the body. A little bit of review, adenosine triphosphate, of course, ATP. And um, that's important to know, by the way, those three, those three, um, uh, specific adaptations that occur. So the metabolic, um, uh, the energy, how energy is, is um, utilized and adapts to creating ATP, neuromuscular type of exercise, the speed of contraction, and then the amount of weight that you would be using, mechanical specificity. Um, now we have progressive adaptations from resistance training. What are what are the adaptive responses that occur? Well, number one is increased stabilization, the ability of the body to uh, provide optimal dynamic joint support, right? Um, so stabilization, training with weights generally leads to, if it's done correctly, right? If you're using the proper modalities, balance training, core stabilization is going to increase stabilization, muscle endurance, but again, what type of what type of adaptive that type of adaptive response is going to come from what a very special way of training not it's not going to be heavy weights that's going to create muscle strain so muscle endurance um, is going to you're going to get that adaptive response based on this special 
specialized way of training. In other words, doing higher repetitions and lower and lower rates. So that's muscle endurance. Muscle um, hypertrophy, that's, um, that's a specific response to the total volume and intensity of the resistance training that you're doing. Um, muscular hypertrophy occurs through fairly specific type of training, training programming that increases the total amount of protein and sarcoplasm inside muscle cells. Muscle cells, by the way, grow or increase in hypertrophy uh, due to increased myofibrillar protein content. So more actin and myosin filaments are going to adhere to the outer, to the outer areas of the myofibrils. And that's how muscle cells ultimately are going to increase in size. But there's also uh, the liquid content or the sarcoplasm inside muscles. So that's muscle hypertrophy. And then of course, muscle strength. And um, you're going to get a chart, you're going to get a table in here that gives you the general guidelines on how to uh, the, how to train to get that particular adaptive response. Okay, so muscle endurance is an adaptive response to training with this repetition range, this number of sets. Muscle hypertrophy is going to be a little bit different, right? Lower a little bit lower on the repetition scale than endurance, uh, but still more than strength and power. So. Strength is an adaptive response. There are specific ways to train for strength. You got to use heavier, heavier weights when you're training your clients. You've got to add them in there to get them stronger because strength is the ability to move a load. Power, right? The next one is power, um, is the ability to move a load over a given period of time. See the difference? So strength is the ability to bench press 200 pounds. If I can bench press 205 pounds, I am stronger. Power now is the time element. If I can, if I can bench press 200 pounds and it takes me four seconds ugh, to push it up this way, if I take the 200 pounds again and I can push it and it only takes me three seconds, I am now more powerful in that particular movement at that particular load. So that's the um, back to the rate of force production. Uh, these are the adaptive, this is the way that the muscular system, neuromuscular system will adapt to, um, to the training. Then we have uh, probably some of the most important things you got to memorize and write down and rewrite. And those are the acute variables of training, right? And those are listed for you in this little helpful, helpful hint box. Reps, sets, training intensity, uh, tempo of the repetition itself, Rest intervals, train volume, frequency, duration. Um, what exercises are you going to do? And what's the order of those exercises? So there's your two, four, five. There's 10 variables. And that's why that helpful hint box, something just write them down. Make sure you know them. For the most part, you know about seven of them right off the top of your head. How many reps? How many sets? Um, how fast are you going to do it? How intense is it going to be? How's, what's the total volume? And then you got to kind of think, well, okay, so what are some other ones? Well, what exercises are you going to do? Okay, so those those are the um, uh, those are the acute variables that you need to be considering, and so now uh, we're going to move into a definition explanation of each one each one of those. Again, there is a sidebar. Repetitions. What is a rep? It's a complete movement pattern for a particular movement on a squat. It's a a full repetition is when you go down and you come back up. You start here, you go here, and you go back to there. That's a rep, repetition. So it's a full, it's a full number, it's a full um, uh, complete pattern for that particular movement. Bench press, you start here, you come down to here, you come back to there. That's one repetition. A set is a grouping of repetitions. So you do 10 reps for one set, just as a for instance, right? You do one, two, three, whatever. And then you put the weight down. And once you go into a rest period, that defined the set. And so a set is a number of repetitions. Training um, intensity, or in other words, the total load that you're using. Normally, we just uh, use, a, use a percent of max for that particular movement. But it's normally, it's normally the amount of weight you're using. That's going to be the training intensity going to be based obviously on fitness level, total strength that a person brings to the table, um, nutritional status. Those are the things that you can read under training intensity. 
And then the repetition tempo, how, how far, you know, if you're going down on a squat, how long does it take? Three seconds, four seconds. You can do it in any, in any uh, way you want. You can do super slow negatives, right? And then you can go quickly on the way up. But repetition tempo is one of those variables that you can make modifications to. And that's what you're, that's what you're getting here with repetition tempo. Um, and by the way, the uh, table 23 is giving you some really, this is a bing, bing, bing. You really need to look and memorize this table. It's very, um, it's very important. So, so keep that in mind, table 20, uh, 23, very important. Rest interval, how much time do you take in between your sets? If you're doing three sets of, um, you know, eight to 10 repetitions on dumbbell curls, for instance, well, that's great, but that's only, that's only two of the, two of the variables that we need to be working with the number of reps and number of sets. Well, how long are you gonna take in between those sets? Are you gonna rest 30 seconds? Or are you gonna rest two minutes, right? That's going, to, that's going to dictate how your body adapts to that training, that training scenario. So you have, to, you have to define what your rest interval is and then you can make modifications. Uh, rest interval is going to determine a lot about the total amount of load you can use and about the total amount of uh, total amount of time that you're going to spend in your training. So again, it's a it's an acute variable, and you need to know why it's important. Um, training volume, the total amount. Of, normally, what we call volume is simply the number of reps times the number of sets by the total number of exercises in a given workout. You can define training volume by the particular body part you're working if you wanted to. But again, normally training volume is the total amount of repetitions that were performed in a particular training training session, right? And so um, it's very important that you keep that in mind. Normally what happens is that if people are, are going into a state of overtraining, they're not recovering. It's normally due to the training volume, not the training intensity. It's not because you lifted too heavy. It's because you lifted too heavy for too many reps, too many sets over an extended workout. And of course, that's going to that's gonna come up with uh, training, training duration. So next one is training frequency. Again, table 20.4, re uh, resistance training status. If you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced, what are your recommended frequency values, right? Number of sessions per week. You can train once. By the way, your business model also is going to affect this. This is academic. Most clients um, are going to train once, maybe twice a week because the cost of your training sessions might be an impediment to them training three or more days a week, depending on how much you charge. But ideally, the training frequency component of this is, um, is going to be based on, for the most part, recovery and your training volume. See, they all kind of work together, these acute variables. Training duration, um, what's the length of time that it takes you to go through the beginning warm up all the way to the warm down of your training session? Is it 20 minutes, 30 minutes, is it an hour? Um, and there are criteria that you would you would use and they, they are intuitive, they make sense. A beginner you know, should not be training for an hour and a half. Doesn't make any sense in the fact that um, most higher level um, athletes train an hour and a half and they have significantly um, more supportive recovery systems. So training duration is critical. Uh, what about your exercise selection and exercise order, right? It's gonna be based a lot on your, um, on your training routine. If you're training the entire body, right? You gotta do one exercise or so per body part. That's going to help you with your selection. Normally, what we say is that you train larger muscle groups, larger muscle um, to the to the smaller, and that makes sense because larger muscle groups require more energy, more energy expenditure, more uh, output. And by the time you finish doing a set of squats, right, um, you know now you can actually go and move on to these smaller muscle groups um, versus doing your biceps and your triceps, for instance, and then going and training your chest. It makes more sense to train the larger muscle groups when you have the most energy, which is at the beginning of the workout. Um, and this then leads to exercise order, right? So exercise selection, again, uh, based, on, uh, uh, based on number of times a week you're gonna train, if you're doing a split routine or not. Exercise order, obviously, um, 
it's going to it's going to um, include right the variables we just talked about. But if you're doing a split routine, for instance, and you're doing pushing movements, uh, what would be your exercise order? Well, you would start with you know your chest and then your shoulder and your triceps. If you're doing like an upper body workout, you know what would be the exercise order? Well, again, you would be using uh, the larger muscle groups first, back down to the smaller muscle groups, or exercise selection and exercise order uh, kind of work together. You know, back to exercise selection, one of the other things to consider um, uh, with, uh, with this idea of which exercises would you use for a particular, for a particular uh, training session. Um, if you were to do, uh, just as a for instance, uh, if you were to do a full body, full body workout, um, you could do squats and then move right into a, an exercise that's a single joint movement, like a leg extension. So your exercise selection, um, like I said before, is going to be determined to a great extent uh, by the type of workout that you're going to be uh, moving, your, moving your clients to. So multi-joint exercises, right, versus single joint exercises. Um, if you have the time, you can do more single joint exercises. But if you don't have the time and you're doing like a full body workout, multi-joint exercises. And then exercise order, large muscle groups, smaller muscle groups. Um, and now the training systems. Now, before you go on, before you start reading, go to table uh, 20.25, uh, because that basically gives you all the summary you need from, from what um, you're gonna read through the next couple of pages. So the muscle training system, in other words, Warm-up sets, single sets, multi-sets, pyramids, what are they? Well, you should be able to, you should be able to know a, a number of these if you've been training for any, any length of time. Uh, but what you definitely want to do is read through the type and know what its definition is. Nazem gave it to you right in the table. Of course, if you got the time, go ahead and read through, read through these. But there it is, right there on page 625. Supersets, complex training, of course. Um, drop sets, giant sets, all of these are different ways that you can, that you can um, increase or, or even decrease the level of intensity. Normally we're trying to increase the level of intensity, decrease the rest time. For instance, supersets, supersets, drop sets, giant sets, all give you the opportunity to reduce the rest period so you can get more work done, increase the total of volume in the same or less period of time. Um, just keep in mind, in the real world, if a client's training with you once a week, you're training their entire body. If you only have 30 minutes in your workout to do that, well, you better think of ways to reduce the total amount of rest time. Well, that's where supersets come in, that's where drop sets come in. Giant sets, three or more exercises done without any rest in between. Rest pause set is basically a way to extend the, the set past what you would normally be able to do by allowing for a brief rest period to allow for regeneration of the ATP PC system. Pretty straightforward understanding it. Um, circuit training, right, simply allows for um, multiple exercises to be done, you know, one right after the other. And uh, peripheral heart action system, upper body exercise, right after that lower body exercise. So bench presses, upper body, right into squats. That's what the, um, the peripheral heart action system, training system um, is. I'm gonna tell you, you try, doing, you try doing that workout, that is an amazing, amazing workout to get your heart rate up and work lots of muscle tissue. Split routine system is now an issue related to uh, training frequency, right? Split routine simply means that we're going to do different body parts on different days of the week. And so table, uh, table 26, peripheral, uh, peripheral heart action, table 27, split routine system, sample workouts. Again, these are samples. You don't have to memorize, you do not have to memorize table 27, but it gives you some samples and ideas. Um, vertical loading versus horizontal loading, pretty important concepts um, to keep in mind. Vertical loading, right? Vertical up and down, horizontal straight across. All vertical loading and horizontal loading is saying, how are you going to perform um, the exercises within your training session? 
Um, in vertical loading, the idea is that you would do a full body exercise like a um, uh, dumbbell, you know, holding dumbbells, doing a squat, curl, press. That's kind of a full, full body workout. And by the way, you'll see that um, as you get into, into um, page 638, actually 6, 640 is where you're going to see total body exercise descriptions. You can do any one of those, for instance. So you'll do a total body exercise for 15, 20 reps, whatever the number is. And you can see coaching tip, complete exercises for each body part before beginning the next set. So what you're going to do is a, is a total body, total body exercise. Um, and then you're going to move into specific exercises for particular body parts. So if you're training a full body, let's just say you're training full body, um, you are going to, you're going to, you're going to train um, an actual exercise for that body part, um, but you're going to do a total body exercise prior to moving into each one of those exercises. So you would do a total body exercise, put the weight down, and then you would move right into, in this case, say a chest exercise, like a bench press, move right into a back exercise, and then move into a shoulder exercise. And you can see how this works all the way down and then you would do legs. So this is an example. Table 28 is a vertical loading example. You would do a set, move to another exercise, do a set, do another exercise, do a set. That's called vertical loading. Horizontal loading is the concept where I would stick with a particular exercise for the requisite number of sets before moving to the next exercise. So you see, I've got five exercises I'm doing. Vertical loading means I do one set, Another set, another set, another set, another set. Horizontal loading means I'm going to do this set for three. I'm going to do this exercise for three sets. Take a rest. This exercise, three sets, just as a for instance, and move forward like that. So horizontal loading versus vertical loading. There's pros and cons to both, and you can read through them. Um, then we're going to move into what's called um, safe environment, which means proper equipment setup. Spotting techniques, again, this is for one-on-one -on -one training for the most part. Normally when we do group training, we don't really do as much spotting, uh, for instance, because we're not doing heavy, you know, super heavy squats with folks, but you do need to know basic spotting techniques and how to monitor um, exercise. And look, there you go. Table 20, 10 is the rating of perceived exertion chart again. Uh, just a quick review for you. Um, Remember the five kinetic chain checkpoints um, while you're doing the particular exercises. Um, and in this case, when you look at figure 28, start from the feet, knees, hips, just look at an individual when they're doing squat. By the way, that picture that they have there is really um, an ideal squat position. Everybody's gonna look different when they do their squat because of unique biomechanics. But the concept here is the same. If you see the two parallel lines, the, the torso, the torso and the and the lower legs should basically be um, parallel to each other at, at an angle, obviously. And that's what's that uh, that's what that picture is showing you. Proper breathing technique. Uh, proper breathing, normally we inhale on the negative and exhale on the positive. But what um, what they want you to get here is to understand that the Valsalva maneuver can be useful, right? But it can also be uh, dangerous, so you've got to be careful. And then on page 635, we have the guidelines for resistance training. And again, they've given you, they have given you on table 2011, some of the parameters and then the variables that you would be using and thinking about when you put together a training, uh, training program. Resistance training progressions. Again, it's important to understand this idea of progressions during an exercise or from one set to another and how to, and the opposite of progression is regression. If you've tried to do something with a client and you've got to now back them off because it was too difficult, normally you should not have to, normally should not have to do that because you would have started at a lower level of intensity and then progress them um, versus doing too much and then having to regress them. Uh, but the idea here is that there is a um, 
you know, sort of a standard way that we move people from one level of training intensity and proprioceptive, uh, proprioceptive environmental richness to increasing the uh, proprioceptive enrichment component of the exercise, right, by um, stabilization focused exercises. So on pages 636 and starting from there, you're going to see some of the basic progressions, right? And so uh, normally we move from bilateral movements, right, to unilateral movements, right? There's pros and cons to this. Keep that in mind. There's proprioceptive um, adaptation, which is good, but there's also the fact that I have a certain amount of time I need to train somebody in. And when I do dumbbell curls and now I do a single, I've just doubled the amount of time that it's gonna take me to get through that particular exercise. So. You just got to keep that in mind that um, that progressions like this in this standard format, bilateral to unilateral, is very beneficial from that neuro neuromuscular um, uh, developmental concept, right? So proprioception, and that's the idea. Moving from this to this increases the uh, proprioceptive en enrichment of the environment, which is beneficial to balance and core stabilization. Uh, then what we do is we would move, for instance, from both legs on the ground to lifting one leg off the ground. That's going to really, really challenge the balance component. Uh, then, of course, you can add add both of those. You can do two, you know, bilateral movements with one leg, and then do unilateral movements on one leg. And uh, these are some of the concepts and ideas that now NASM wants you to really consider when you're trying to progress people through their resistance training program. So strength focused exercises, um, of course, can be progressed as well. Uh, power focused exercises as well can be, uh, can be progressed. And that's what you're getting here um, on page 638. Uh, the pictures of course are very helpful. Just so you know, these, um, uh, these diagrams and pictures that they're giving you in these figures uh, can be very helpful when you try doing these yourself. So now when you get to 640, like I said, it's a long chapter, but almost half of it is just the actual exercises. So of course, go through the exercises. You should know, look, as a trainer, you should know basically all of these exercises. Just make sure you look at mm, the technique box and if there are safety boxes. So Look up at the uh, name of the exercise and know the basic technique. You should be able to basically intuitively figure out what muscles are being worked and what kind of the point of this exercise and the and the progressions that um, that they fit into. Um, Multiplanar lunge, squat. You can do um, um, two arm push press. Obviously, each of these exercises has a has a component variable associated with it um, that you do need to know. So again, here we are at the safety boxes. So on page 646, it's not a technique issue now. There are safety concerns, and those are the things that you do that you do want to read for sure. Again, as you move through the rest of this rest of this chapter, it's basically exercises. You do want to know the exercises because they're you know, for sure there can be questions that'll ask, how would you progress from a front medicine ball throw and progress that to make it more um, proprioceptively enriching to increase stabilization and balance? Well, obviously it would be a front to an oblique. Then you could do, of course, uh, more power-based movements, um, single leg, right? So these are the progressions that you have to keep in mind. And as you move through the, move through the chapter, like I say, half of it, um, is just those is just those exercises. You've got your summary, go through the chapter review, and then of course the chapter highlights. Chapter 20 got a ton of information, a ton of information that you need to know and, and memorize and take your time going through it. Um, and then make sure you know those exercises. Once again, um, I've said it before in the other chapters, you should do these exercises yourself, spend some time physically doing them so that you get a better appreciation um, for not only how they work and what they're functionally designed to do, but what it would be like for your, for your clients. And, um, and so that ends 
chapter 20. And again, uh, we're going to move into section six, which is going to start um, the last grouping of chapters. And the first one that we're going to hit will be chapter 21. So look forward to seeing you on that chapter.